we were making it up as we went along. We didn't know the arts and culture scene in depth, and we weren't in the computer era right. yet. Um, so it wasn't like we could like click on somewhere and find out what's going on around town. So what we came up with was um, just a lot of networking. Um, we would read the, the Friday magazine, um, whatever the, the alternative weekly was, um, just go knock on doors and say, you look interesting, um, tell us about yourself. It, it wasn't like we sat down in, in a room and said, yes, we'd like to do an arts and culture show and here's our plan. We were just um, dancing as fast as we could to, to make it work. And um, by the end of the first year, I think we had a workable, a workable knowledge base of who was doing what in town and how to find more people. And the longer we did it, the bigger our Rolodex got. We were still writing down names and numbers on little cards and um, writing our scripts out on typewriters. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but the, the longer we did it, the, the bigger our, our, our contacts got and they told people and they told people. And at the same time that our show was growing, we were seeing that the arts and culture scene was growing too. Mm -hmm. There were more galleries coming online, more dance troupes, more, um, more, more exhibits um, in odd places that they hadn't been before. And so we tried as much as we could to, um, to not just stay up with what was current, but to figure out what would be the next thing coming or, or who's, who's somebody nobody's talking about right. um, so, so we can be there to, to watch them grow. And, and it worked. Right. <laughs> I, was say. I talk to a lot, I have a lot of, I have a wide range of friends. And I think that they think because I'm in white environments a lot of times that, well, it's different, you understand. And they don't understand that, yes, I am allowed to be someplace, but there's a difference between being allowed to be someplace and being the demographic they're looking for. Yes, I have the right to walk into your restaurant. I have the right to sit at this counter, yes. But when I walk in, do I get a smile? Are you looking for me? Are you happy that I'm here? Does it make your, are you happier that I've arrived? And I'm never, wanted, I'm accepted. At least that's how I perceive it. And it's always polite and it's cool and everything's fine, but there, I know there's a difference. I know there's a difference. It's the difference between being family and guests. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. I'm always a guest in, in, in this particular social house. Yes, Ooh, good. and that's, that's a... That's heavy. Ooh, that was good. Good. With me being a um, androgynous queer black male appearing as something else, Sometimes you're wanted and other times you're not. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, we mm -hmm. have a gay black man here mm -hmm. who looks like a woman, oh my God. And then there's the one who's always like, oh my God, for real, mm -hmm. for real. And it's just like, well, dag, like, can I just be? Right. Like, can I just be? But Sometimes you, you forget that you're unwanted. You forget that you're unwanted and then you get a little lost mm -hmm. and you buy into. You think everything is sweet. Everything, everything is sweet. Gray and rosy, look, I'm at this beautiful restaurant. I'm the only black person. They love me, but actually, no. Oh, <laughs> and you have a five octave range mm -hmm. and you, you sing, you do jazz music, you do classical music, you do all of these different genres. So you're diverse and, you mm -hmm. know, right. you have all these things that when you're a part of the group, it makes the group better. So, yeah, we're going to let you stay here for a while. I always get from at least one person per show that's maybe seen my work online or something like that. I get at least one person that's like, oh, I wasn't expecting someone like you to make these. And I'm, I never really know exactly what that means, but <laughs> I get that at least once a show. Or the, I, oh, you're, you're not what I expected. <laughs> My other favorite one is, is like me having a conversation with someone, explaining how I make things, just like the same way I'm talking to you right now, and getting, which I talk to several other artists that get the same thing, but you speak so well. That's one of my 
favorite, least favorite comments. And then just people not believing that I make actually make these things. I get a lot from people that, oh, where did you buy these from? And then I explain how I make them. Or sometimes I will literally be sitting there making them. Like, I was at a show recently and a guy was looking at my stuff and his son walked up and he's like, oh yeah, she says she makes these, but I think she buys them from somewhere. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, and I was just kind of polite about it. I'm like, sir, if you look behind the table right here, I'm sitting here with clay and tools and I'm literally making them right now. And he just kind of went, okay, and just walked away. And unfortunately, every single time that it is someone that is like that is a non-person of color that is highly skeptical about the skills or talents that I may have. And I kind of just try to take it on the chin and just like, because I know not everybody is like that. And it's like, like I said, it's only like one or two people, like sometimes per show or every month, like couple shows or something like that. It's <laughs> okay. Hi, how are you doing today? There was someone who told me a while back that the city of Cleveland doesn't believe that there are any black artists. And that was like really crazy to me. Um, there's a huge project went down with Land Studios. I'm going to use Land because me and several other artists all, you know, signed up for the project that he was working on. But what they did not do is hire any black artists. They sent a bunch of artists from outside of Cleveland to do this huge mural project here. And then you sit here with all these artists in Cleveland, you know, and you're not even giving them a shot to be a part of the city. So wait a minute, uh, real quick though, that um the land project is that the one? Yeah, the land right studios, one? yeah. On, um, the whole red line and you know, what's so crazy line. about that is that back in the day we you know, I was one of the young cats, like I grew up around some OGs, you know what I mean, that they was already doing it. So so like we made the red line hot to the point like the police was trying to lock us up for it and transit police and they was buffing over our art and everything. And all we wanted to do was just show the city our talents, you know what I mean? They didn't look at it like that. It was a crime, and, you know, they didn't want us to do anything. So years later, what's the coincidence? Here's this billion million dollar project, and none of the people that really made that um, area, you know, what it is, couldn't even get to a piece of that. You feel me? So what we learned to do is that we just go do our own thing regardless of what the city, you know, feel or think about us and you know and not even make the race an issue and just continue to just shine and blossom in our own right and so we pretty much make our own scene and, you know and we do our own thing you know what i mean and not worry about you know the higher powers to be if they're going to accept it or not you know what i mean but they are going to accept it because they're going to see us shining in them so Am I not supposed to swear? You can swear. Oh, okay. I just like, I'm generally one of those people who just gives zero fucks about everything. So like I write about like my mental illness a lot and like one of the first few pieces I had out was about just like um, race and gender in the psych ward. So that like addresses a lot of like very taboo subjects all at once. Right. <laughs> um, it's actually one of the things I'm, one of the articles I'm proudest of. Um, but yeah, I feel like people do end up putting you in kind of like a little bit of a corner. Like they don't know if you can write something else. Right. Um, especially being an activist and like wanting to do journalistic work. Like I've literally read articles being like coming out as an activist while you're a journalist. And I was just like, I, I think that's like a very privileged thing to be able to do. Mm. Like. You know, to to write about like tragedies and like police brutality and like not do anything about it just right. seems like kind of incomprehensible to me. I can write like this fluff piece about like five things not to do in a relationship. It just I happen to write like also six other things about like racism in America. Like <laughs> I, that's, I feel like people tend to like box you in sure. and think of you as like um, just an activist and like that's my primary goal in wanting to write and like a lot of like mental health advocacy as well but it would just 
I, I think people do tend to like brush you off and being like, okay, right. she's just that like, she's that wacko, black lives matter girl. Yeah, wacko <laughs> leftist. Yeah, right. black lives matter. Chick, <laughs> like, we'll we'll find someone else. All right. Queer tailoring to me is it's not it's not sexuality specific. It's not sexual specific. It's um or queer isn't like the the original use of the word of being different and um, eccentric, odd. Um, so it goes both into like queer people needing to have something specifically for themselves, whether they're um, wanting a more masculine fit on a feminine body or the other way around, but also for like somebody who wants studs on their jacket. I'll have folks come in who are like, you're the only LGBT centered um, a tailoring shop in the Midwest and it's like why why is that like I like to say I can't clothe all the queers like <laughs> so it's like that's why I, I never saw it as like I want to get all of this business for myself no it's so other folks can see it and um, and do different their own different ideas and and create their own different client bases whether it's queer tailoring or just queer centered spaces um, and BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, you know, centered spaces. And I try to keep my prices accessible because of that. Like, that is an issue with tailors and seamstresses, especially in Ohio, is overcharging Black and brown people. Like, for the big booties, for the different sizes, like, double, triple charging. Like, waste, that's just taking in the waste is what I'll do. Um, 15 and $17. Um, other people will come in with like, oh, I just came from this place. They were trying to charge me $70 for this. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, it doesn't have to be a luxury. There was a time when alterations, tailoring, it was just typical. It was normal. You went to the store, you got clothes, and you got it altered for yourself. But now it is seen as such a luxury. And especially if, if you don't look like the kind of clientele that they want to see in their business, then they're going to upcharge. And that's an issue.